So if we have to solve a linear system of equations, then we can apply LU factorization or PLU factorization, which takes two thirds n cubed flops for an n by n matrix. Now, if that's all you know, that's what you have to do, but many problems come with some known structure that can simplify finding the solution. One of those structures is bandedness. So we say a matrix is banded if we know that certain elements are zero. Whenever the column index minus the row index is greater than B sub U, we say that's the upper bandwidth of the matrix. And if we know that the elements are zero, if I minus J is greater than some B sub L, then B sub L is the lower bandwidth of the matrix. So for example, if we draw a matrix, we just show where the non-zeros are in that matrix with X's. Not that they're all the same number. So if you start at the main diagonal, and if all of the elements here are within two diagonals of that, then we'd say the upper bandwidth is two. And if all the elements are within one diagonal down with that, then we say the lower bandwidth is one. And then we would say the total bandwidth is the lower plus the upper plus one. So in this case, that's four. That's the total number of diagonals where we can find non-zero elements. So banded matrices often model local interactions. Each variable only interacts with one or a few of its neighbors. If we do naive value factorization, that is without any pivoting, then the L matrix inherits the lower bandwidth of A, and the U matrix inherits the upper bandwidth of A. The situation gets more complex if you have to add pivoting, which you do for stability in general. It's a little complicated to do so, and we're going to skip that. So here I'm going to create an 8 by 8 matrix. And I want to limit the bandwidth of this matrix. So what I'll do is I'll use the trial command that extracts a lower triangular part. But because of this two here, it means that it's going to start at two above the main diagonal. And so that will limit the upper bandwidth of A, as you can see here. And then I'll use try U with a negative value. So I get the upper part below the negative one diagonal. And so that limits the lower bandwidth. All right, so I have lower bandwidth one, upper bandwidth of two now. And here's what we would do if we started our LU factorization. So the first row of U comes from the first row of A, so it naturally inherits the same upper bandwidth. And then L1 comes from, or the, I'm sorry, the first column of L comes from the first column of A. And so that naturally inherits the lower bandwidth. If I look at this first outer product, this is the thing that I'm going to subtract off of A next. Then because of the structure of the first column of L and the first column of U, it has the correct upper bandwidth and lower bandwidth, so that when I do subtract it off from the original A, I don't change them. I still have an upper bandwidth of 2 and a lower bandwidth of 1. And so everything is going to continue from there. Um, every new row and column that I pull off is going to share the same bandwidth as the original matrix. The downside of doing this, of course, is that we can't do row pivoting, and that means it might be unstable. If we do do row pivoting by letting MATLAB do the factorization, you'll see U has a higher bandwidth than before. And L isn't necessarily banded at all. It's got a lot of zeros, but it's not banded. So we lose a lot of the structure when we do row pivoting. MATLAB can take advantage of banded structure automatically. So here I'm going to create a rather large matrix, 3200 by 3200, given an upper and lower bandwidth of 2. 
and then solve a linear system with it. So let me run that a couple more times, try to get an accurate timing. So you see it's about 0.18 or so in terms of the time. If you just handed a matrix, MATLAB doesn't know that this, hap this matrix happens to have a banded structure. It just pretends that it's a regular old matrix. So actually, we can see it here. You see that banded structure. But MATLAB doesn't know it, and it doesn't take advantage of it when it solves a linear system. In order to get it to do that, you have to tell it that the matrix has a lot of zeros in it. And that's what sparse does. It converts A to a form where the non-zeros are singled out, and then it knows when it solves a linear system that it ought to be able to take advantage of that zero structure. And so you can see that it's much faster. Even though it's doing row pivoting with its factorization here underneath the hood, you can see that it's more than 100 times faster to do it this way. Another very common type of matrix structure is symmetry. So when we say a matrix A is symmetric if A transpose equals A, symmetric matrices arise when variable I affects variable J the same way as variable J affects variable I. In other words, the interactions are symmetric. So if A equals LU, let's forget about pivoting for a moment, then A transpose, by the rules of transpose, of products is U transpose L transpose. U is upper triangular, its transpose is lower triangular, and L's transpose is upper triangular, so this still looks like lower times upper, but it can't be equal to the original factorization. Since A transpose is equal to A, we would like this to equal A again, but that's impossible because we said that L has to have ones on the unit diagonal, and that's not going to be true of U transpose. It turns out you can modify the idea just a bit by finding a factorization in the form L times D times L transpose, where now L is unit lower triangular, so it's lower on the left and upper on the right, and D is diagonal. So essentially we take all of those non-1s and we lump them together into a D in the middle. Now this is an unpivoted factorization. If we want to pivot it, it is possible, but it's a bit complicated. We're going to skip that because we're after something even more specific. And that's a symmetric positive definite matrix. A symmetric positive definite matrix is symmetric, and then it has another property as well. The number A transpose A times X is positive for all non-zero vectors X. So this product here is called a quadratic form. Since x is a column vector, it has the form of row times square times column, and that's one by one, so it's scalar. These matrices do come up in applications, although the reasons are a bit more complicated. And it's not easy to detect a symmetric positive definite matrix just by looking at its elements. So normally you have some sort of theoretical reason for believing or knowing that it is an SPD matrix. Since A is a symmetric matrix, if it's SPD, it has an LDL transpose factorization. So if we put that into the quadratic form, and then we use some associative properties of a multiplication, then we see this actually has the form of another quadratic form on D where this vector z is L transpose times x. So this inequality is supposed to be true for all different x, so it ought to be true for all z as well. And if we choose z to be each of the columns of the identity matrix, what we'll find out is that all the diagonal entries of d have to be positive. So that's a necessary condition for an SPD matrix. It's not sufficient. But it does mean that this diagonal matrix has a very simple square root form, which is something that not all matrices have. So if we just take the square root of each diagonal element, then we can expand D into the product of these two square root matrices. And then we can again associate these together 
and use rules about multiplying transposes. And what we see is that A is equal to R transpose times R, where R is upper triangular. So this is a truly symmetric factorization now. It's called a Cholesky factorization of A. One of the interesting things is that you can prove that it's stable even without pivoting. So we don't have to worry about pivoting for an SBD matrix. Also because you essentially have half as many unique elements, it takes about half as many flops asymptotically as LU factorization. Of course, the limitation is that it's only available for SPD matrices. If I just generate a matrix randomly, it's obviously not very likely to be symmetric. But there is a trick for making a symmetric matrix out of it. Just take it and add it to its transpose, and then the resulting A will be symmetric. However, it's unlikely that this A will be positive definite. One of the nice things about the Cholesky factorization is that it will fail for you if you give it a non positive definite matrix. So it is actually a conclusive test for being positive definite. Now I have to comment this out and rerun so that MATLAB is not so unhappy. Another way we can create a symmetric matrix out of a non-symmetric X is to multiply X transpose times X. And this thing is almost always positive definite. So if we do the Cholesky factorization on that, it'll succeed. And we can check that it is a correct, we can see that it's upper triangular, and we can check that it's a correct factorization. And we can check that it's a correct factorization.